Well, Charlotte, thank you so much for having me as a guest in your home and for being here with Sovereign Solutions. And to begin with, why don't you tell us about how you discovered what you've discovered? That's a very good place to start because uh, I guess everybody has to start there. You know, why do so many of us uh, spend our, our lives once we find out what's really going on in the world? We spend our, our whole life trying to help other people understand so that future generations will live in freedom and prosperity and, and uh, be allowed to think, speak, act according to their own conscience, right? Uh, my, my journey started probably, I, I, I was a foreign service girl, I, I spent 18 years abroad, first of all working for the American Red Cross in Korea, uh, not in Korea, during the Korean War, I was meant to go to Korea, but I didn't, I was stationed on the island of Guam and in Japan. And uh, then I came back on a freighter, French freighter, third class, that was fascinating, I all the misconceptions I had about Joseph McCarthy being uh, a rabble rouser, etc., when he discussed communist infiltration in our government, uh, were uh, dissolved, diluted, went down the tubes when I sat next to uh, people from North Vietnam and China who had just gotten out of the communist countries. And I listened to them. I speak French, so they spoke French. I was able to understand uh, what was going on in communist countries and that actually there was something that we should be worried about, very, very worried about. And uh, that was my first little bit of awakening. And then I, I came back to the United States and I was back for about six months and I joined the Foreign Service. I went into the United States Department of State and I worked, uh, I was an administrative assistant to ambassadors abroad the first one was in South Africa, and the second one was uh, Douglas MacArthur, the second, the the uh, general's nephew in Brussels, and that's where I met my husband in Brussels. And uh, I remember very definitely there were certain you know signs along the way that I I noticed, and I thought, what's going on here with American foreign policy? such as the United Nations in Katanga, in the Belgian Congo. I was right there seeing all the cables coming in from Elizabethville, uh, coming in from the Congo, Katanga, what the UN forces were doing, raping nuns. Uh, horrible, horrible. It's Katanga, I mean, nobody likes to talk about it anymore because they got deep into that one. They know how absolutely evil, satanic, rotten the United Nations is. As a matter of fact, I recently showed a documentary on Sovereign Solutions about Katanga. Good. The one, the one that is uh, issued by Reality Zone. Ed, Ed, oh, yeah, Ed, Ed, Ed Griffin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so that was uh, quite a wake-up call for me. I was sitting in the office in Brussels. Of course, the Belgians were... Uh, my landlady was uh, terribly upset with American... Oh, who wouldn't be? The Belgians were very upset with U.S. foreign policy. Uh, my own boss, General uh, Ambassador MacArthur, I think he was very upset with it too, but he had to carry out what the president wanted. And uh, he had to carry out the president's uh, foreign policy. And uh, anyway, then I got married. We came back to the United States. Came back, I, ca I left Belgium, came back to the United States. My husband came over. We got married. Then we went interestingly enough, back to Belgium for four or five years, which is a lovely period in my life, had one child, then, I, then we went, uh, because my husband is a uh, yacht, uh, yacht captain, and that's what he's always done all his life, plus selling yachts, and we, we, he crossed the Atlantic on an Alden schooner, we bought a schooner in Brittany, and uh, we went to Grenada in the West Indies, where uh, uh, he operates that schooner as a charter boat out of Grenada for six years. That was an interesting place to be as well, because later on, the hardcore communist regime took over there. It was really a Stalinist regime that took over in Grenada. And I can thank Ronald Reagan for one thing, although he shouldn't have done it because it was a UN operation again. 
Uh, but going in there, as he did, uh, saying the excuse was to rescue American students, I believe the excuse really was to protect the oil lines, but, you know, down to Trinidad, etc. Uh, but anyway, regardless of what the excuse was, we have marvelous friends down there who benefited enormously, and uh, the stories coming out of Grenada were another thing, of uh, communism in action little micro, microcosm. Grenada was a great study. I mean, if, if only stu students in college would just uh, spend one week, their professors, uh, teaching them what happened in Grenada and how every single aspect of the system, the government, the, the economy, the agriculture, the education system was turned on its head by the communists. And a good percentage of the Grenadians left the island because of it, right? So I learned a lot there. But you asked me what really got me started. We came back to the United States, and I had two young children. And so I naively put them in the public school system because I didn't know how horrible it was. I had no idea what, what was going on in this country, what had happened in the 18 years that I'd been abroad. And um, all of a sudden, I, you know, I asked the, the principal over at the elementary school if I could see the new social studies textbooks for elementary school. And he, he gave me the teacher's manual, which was the biggest mistake he ever made. You know, he didn't make any more mistakes like that with me after that, but that was a big mm -hmm. And the, the, the program was called uh, World of Mankind, and the publisher was Follett. And right in the beginning, the teacher was, it was the teacher's manual, was basically telling a teacher what she should be doing with this particular global education course. And it said right there that it was humanistic philosophy, and anybody who knows what the humanist manifesto is, a lot of people don't know. They think humanism is a good, wonderful thing, humane, you know, we'll be nice to our neighbors, and you love everybody. They have no idea that the humanist manifesto is the plan, the total international take over atheistic control plan for the UN. That's what it is. And anything goes, tolerance of everything, no matter what, no religion, no sovereignty, world government, get rid of the military, get rid of, you know, it's just a, it's a basic agenda. And uh, it's been around for a long time and major signers were uh, B.F. Skinner, who's, you know, I could make a pigeon a high achiever by reinforcing it on a proper schedule, which is the method being used in the schools across the board now, being used in our communities now. You do good deeds. The police, community-oriented policing system gives you a little medal if you do a good deed. Here in Bath, Maine, huh? Mm -hmm. Do a good deed. Uh, they determine what a good deed is. That's the uh, reward system that's being put in across across the board. No accountability, no personal accountability as an individual anymore, as a the group, collectivism, communism, work. that's it. So anyway, I saw this, and I thought, wow. And also they had a little uh, project for the teacher, or sort of a little daily escapade. She'd take the little kids, first graders, in town, and they'd look at the houses. This was in beautiful Camden, Maine. And we happened to have a great big captain's house. That didn't mean that we were rich. And uh, a lot of mayors have big houses. That doesn't mean they're rich. And then across the street, you'd have a trailer. And the, the teacher would say, who do you think lives in the captain's house? Who do you think lives in the trailer? What do you think they eat in the captain's house? What do you think they eat in the trailer? And so the children would say, oh, you probably have steak. In the captain's house and pizza in the trailer. And I thought, what are they doing to these children in first grade? This is the beginning of class warfare. So I went to the school board meeting and I complained. I just said I thought this was a very non-academic activity, which had a highly political tone. And uh, what's the purpose? Hmm? Well, huh, the next day... Uh, of course, the newspapers picked it up. I was all over the front page. But the next day, one of our tenants, who also lived overseas for quite a while, and she's very bright and knew what was going on, she said, oh, Charlotte, I was at the co-op today. You know, back then in the 70s, everybody went to the co-op and got cheese and whatever, you know, vegetables cheap and all, large quantities. And she said, oh, the word is out that you're a kook. 
And I thought, oh, okay. Well, that was my introduction to how they deal with people who question them, who uh, do their research, uh, don't like what they see, ask their elected representatives what's going on. Uh, if you get really close to the truth, you're called a kook. And they did that in the Soviet Union, too, and they, you know, they did it in China, any communist, fascist country. Uh, the minute you open your mouth about something, you ask a question, do research, uh, they tell the rest of the community that, you know, she's nice, she's a really nice woman, but maybe, you know, sometimes they don't call her a kook, sometimes they do. Uh, you know, you don't have to be mean to her, but, who, well, who wants to associate, human beings are, it's a, it's a natural reaction. Human beings don't really want to associate with crazy people. You know, they really don't. It's, it's hard work. I mean, it is. People work with them in hospitals. It's, it's hard work. And you admire them for the work they do. So anyway, if you're called a kook, that gets the word out of the community. Don't listen to this woman ever. So I found that out. Then I, um, I ran for school board. And I... I after the third try, boy, they were really upset when I ran. I ran three times. Two times I lost. Third time I won. I did win by a few votes. And they, I remember them, count, they counted the votes two times at the Opera House in Camden just to make sure that, you know, possibly she didn't win. Well, I won. I got on. I, the superintendent was a change agent out of Harvard. And I'll explain what that is in a second, if people don't know. And, uh, I was re I, I did do a pretty good job there. I got rid of the, the values-destroying values clarification. I, I got, even the liberals went along with me getting rid of that horrible Sidney Simon program. And there were, I did get five minutes of grammar a day. Can you imagine? They wouldn't let, this back in the 70s, they were getting rid of everything. Getting rid of the math, good sound math, getting rid of grammar, getting rid of history, getting rid of anything that was academic. Everything was soft fuzzy touchy, kids sitting on the floor studying or in circle, you know, in, at round desks. And uh, I did a pretty good job, but uh, I lost the next election. But while I was on the board, this has to do with change agents, uh, I had a phone call from a retired teacher. And she said, you know, because I've been writing some letters to the paper, too. And, of course, she'd seen everything in the paper, because every time I open my mouth as a board member, they dump on me. And uh, she said, you know, you're absolutely correct. She said, I've been a teacher for many years. I taught in Europe. Uh, she's a master teacher. And she said, uh, you're right on. But she said, I think there's something that maybe it would be good for you to go and see what they're really up to. I want you to go to be trained as a change agent. Well, at that time, I really didn't know what I'd been up against with a superintendent. I really didn't know that there was such a thing as a change agent. And uh, she said, I'll pay for you. And it was $100 back then. And, and uh, it was up in Searsport, Maine, the training. And I went. And there were really nice people there, teachers, principals, etc. <clears throat> Some I knew. Our principal was there from the high school. And, and they luckily gave us a textbook that was a big fat thing called Innovations in Education, A Change Agent's Guide. And it was put together by Professor Ronald Havelock at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And uh, it was federally funded. And it had case studies in it by real teachers. And these were real studies of... Uh, situations rather um, the implementation of very controversial programs in the schools and in other words you have to be trained to manipulate the community in order to get the program in so it taught you there were must be about 25 or 30 of them how these different teachers and principals did it like it was a science teacher who got the sex ed in and how he got around the community and red flags and the Christian uprising and this and that and what do you do? How do you, how do you deal with these people and how do you go after them? And I was trained how to identify the resistors in my community. Absolutely. And when he said that, I thought, you asked me in the beginning. 
what got me going? That got me going. When you are trained to identify yourself, because I was a resistor, I thought, wow, I thought back to the people on the boat uh, coming back on the Vietnam, the, the freighter from the Far East. I thought back to those people from North Vietnam and China, you know, who had told me about identifying resistors and how members of their family were identified and how her grandfather was paraded around town with his head off. He was he had been a leader in town. So they paraded him around. Just his body. So you could see. You don't resist. That's what happens. And so here I was being taught how to identify the resistors. The people who are smart people who know that sex ed, drug ed decision-making, uh, alcohol education, uh, bullying education, critical thinking, everything that has education hanging off the end of it. Watch it. That's a red flag for any parent or anyone out there listening because that is not traditional education. That is brainwashing. Those programs, they say they're for the good of our children. All of them are devoted to behavioral change, behavioral and attitudinal change. And basically, the purpose of them is to do exactly the opposite of what they say they're meant to do. And I have a proof of that in my book, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. 700 pages of documents, chronologically arranged, starting in the late 1800s, mid-1800s, all the way through to today, basically, because George Bush is doing exactly what Clinton was doing, what Reagan, Reagan, Reagan really um, carved the ultimate agenda in stone. They've been working on it for over a hundred, for over about a hundred years, but he carved it in stone when I was in the U.S. Department of Ed, and we'll get into that later. But anyway, uh, the change agent training just scared me to death. These programs, the one I'm talking about here, was death education. The Guidance Counselors Association in Washington, D.C., at their headquarters, they publish a journal. And one of their monthly or quarterly journals was devoted to death education, which I think most parents know. You know, the kids have to go and lie down on tombstones and go to the mortuary and, and study all of the uh, global religions, you know, don't, don't, for, he for, for heaven's sake, don't mention Christianity, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, mysticism, you know, you, you, you know, whatever religion. Everybody's religion except uh, the basic religion for the United States. And the, the funeral ceremonies, right? And But anyway, in this particular issue, it's terribly important because this went out to all the guidance counselors across the country. It said, quote, we, in the, in the death education movement, will use death education to change the students' attitudes and values and beliefs about death and dying the same way we used sex education to change their attitudes towards sex and various sexual practices. And when I saw that, I thought, Sometimes they make mistakes. I guess they never figured I was going to read that. But that was the proof, all the proof I ever needed, that these people, these change agents, their goal is to destroy traditional morality and academics. It's total, deliberate destruction of moral, morals, academic and moral destruction. And people would say, oh, you know, that woman, she's, she is a kook. Why would they do that? Well, it's a lot cheaper than bombers. And it's a lot less obvious. You could take a country through the schools. And they've done it. That's why you have all these people out there who don't understand you. When you try to tell them something, they're nice. They're sweet people. They're friends. They're neighbors. And they look at you with a glazed expression. 
because they have been victimized psychological warfare and it's, it has been played out in the schools and the media every day in the community television etc but the schools basically have, have been and the poor teachers have been victimized even more than the children so anyway I went through that training I was, I was appalled I was also told to identify the important people in the community you know who are the head of the garden club rotary chamber of commerce uh, all, the, all the people that you know good people and they've been taken to the cleaners too they, they think they've been doing the right thing for their I mean some of them are major change agents don't think it's just in the schools you'll have the head of the rotary could be a major change agent to collectivize your community right to sustainable development the schools regionalism all of this is communism regionalism is communism could quote my book from a leading communist who wrote the communist daily world article on this regionalism well Stalin Lenin called for it first of all well regionalism is this is this council form of government which is a Soviet form of government it means you have unelected councils you drop the borders between the town the county and the state you end up with an amorphous group uh, a region which uh, doesn't represent you any longer because it's bigger you know it's it's moved out I was I was the uh, uh, as a school board member I was appointed to be on the uh, vocational ed council for four different school districts and I saw it there that's probably easier for people to understand we were a wealthy town Camden Maine and we ended up paying uh, the lion's share for all the other towns redistribution of wealth redistribution of wealth and uh, the, it, it's getting rid of spreading bringing, bringing in from the countryside to the this is like consolidation with the schools bringing all the little schools into the major central school that's what you call consolidation shut down all those schools out there where the children are closer uh, are closer to their parents the parents could go to the school board meetings etc it's it's making government very distant from the uh, voter or the citizen very distant he no longer really has much of a say because it's been watered down through the big council form of government where they bring everybody into the council system and the other li the little boards just go by the way it's going on all over the country now but anyway this communist writer in my book he said the United States is moving too slowly towards regionalism it worked so well in the Soviet Union oh, that's a good quote and I mean there's so much on regionalism wonderful work that's been done by Americans through the years Arch Roberts did magnificent work Colonel Arch Roberts many many others uh, on my new website americandeception.com there's so much on there in regard to regionalism Don Bell he did a whole series of fantastic newsletters Don Bell was a journalist in World War II who was in a Japanese concentration camp came back to the United States wrote newsletters up until 10 years ago most magnificent work you've ever seen well on my website you have his uh, series of uh, fabulous articles on regionalism and Maureen Heaton's the impossible dream incredible book is also on that website but anyway uh, that's exactly what we were looking at in our community where uh, the leadership of these groups many of them were deliberate and many of them were definitely change agents others perhaps not maybe not Garden Club Historical Society but they were being used I was as a change agent meant to go to them and say well you know we we have a bit of a problem with a, a couple of pregnancies in the high school so we need a sex education pro program well probably in most cases they would target the schools that or the towns that have the, the least problems because they want to create the problem 
I'll never forget in Michigan, uh, some parents calling me and saying, we can't understand why on earth are they putting in the comprehensive health education in, in this community because we don't have any pregnancies. We don't, have, we don't even have problems with the kids drinking or drugs or anything. Why are they putting it here? And I said, because you don't. The goal is to get you to have the problem. And when they can crash the morals and values and they can crash the academics, then they can impose the totalitarian system, which is George Bush is putting in right now. Clinton before, Bush Sr. before, Reagan before, Carter before, uh, whoever, uh, Nixon. Uh, they've all been in it. I mean, you, all the way pre-World pre War I, uh, we have had every single president has had the same agenda. Might as well make that clear. And I mean, sometimes the end of an interview comes and the guy will say, well, do you have anything you want to say? And I say, yeah, there's only one thing you have to remember when you go home. And this is easy. There isn't any difference between the Republican and the Democratic parties at the top. And this has been planned ever since the late 1800s. Carol Quigley said this in Tragedy and Hope. Carol Quigley was Clinton's mentor at Georgetown University. And he wrote this great book, Tragedy and Hope. He was an insider inside the economic, financial elite, right? CF, Council on Foreign Relations, all that. And he didn't have a problem with the idea of world government, which is their goal. But he did say it shouldn't be kept secret from the people. And he was the one who talked about uh, in the late 1800s when the financial elite got together and they said, if we're going to have this international system, we're going to have to control both parties at the top so that when the voters go to the polls, uh, they'll pull a thing and they won't know that it doesn't make any difference who they vote for. They're going to get the, They won't know that. And that's the most important thing for Americans to remember right now. It doesn't make any difference. I mean, people thought that George Bush was going to be a good Christian conservative coming. They should have known better. They should have known that he's, he's not far from his father or his grandfather. But they didn't want to listen. I mean, if I said that, they'd say, oh, you know, again, you know, we're conspiracy. It's another subject. Of course it's conspiracy. It's the only country in the world that doesn't accept the idea of conspiracy. The only country in the world. Now, I've lived all over the world. All other foreigners and people, and I don't care, you know, you, you've traveled enough. There's never been anything that happened in this world politically that wasn't a conspiracy. Well, the Bible is full of conspiracies. I always say it started with Adam and Eve. Yeah. It's full of it, full of it, conspiracy. And Americans have fallen for this. So whenever anybody tells the truth, or, you know, maybe they're not telling the truth, but whenever anybody comes up with some research that they've done, uh, if it doesn't agree with the agenda, and if it exposes the agenda, then they're accused of, of being a conspiracy buff. It's a conspiracy. Or a conspiracy theory. Theory. Yeah. yeah. Conspiracy theory. And so, anyway, um, I went to that training... And I was, uh, I was just uh, blown away by it. And then I went on, started an organization in the state of Maine, Guardians of Education for Maine, which was very effective in the 70s. We did manage to knock out the health education from about a third of the districts in the state of Maine. And then, because I had been very activist, the, I had a friend in White House personnel when Reagan had been elected, and I was a Reagan supporter, a very strong supporter of Ronald Reagan. I didn't want to listen to... Uh, the Southern California people who uh, had warned all of us that Reagan was not what he pretended to be. Huh? And I didn't listen because, you know, you want to hold on to your positive feelings about people. You want to believe in something and someone, and we're all that way. And all I can say is that I've been there. I've, I've believed in a lot of the conservative leadership, and now, now I'm absolutely devastated by what they've done. Uh, they've, they've been total it's treason, what they've pulled on this country, the conservative leadership. And they don't like me because I've, I've blown the whistle on them. And the left doesn't particularly like me either, but 
they find me, I don't get anywhere near the, the flack from the left as I get from the, the uh, neo, neoconservatives. They, they hate me. And they've hated me ever since uh, I wrote my first little book, uh, Back to Basics Reform or Skinnerian International Curriculum. And then it says in a little asterisk below, very little book, it says, Necessary for United States Participation in a One World Government Planned for the Early Years of the 21st Century. It's a long title, little 38-page book that uh, explained exactly what was going to happen in 1985. I wrote it after I was dismissed from my job in the U.S. Department of Ed. I got the job through the White House personnel. Uh, and and uh, what I saw there was so shocking that I leaked a document on, on the computerization of the curriculum for all American schools. Uh, the, the federal coming out of my office, the funding, uh, of, of this technology initiative, I leaked it to the Human Events. And they did a very good article, that was before Human Events really went. And they did a good article on a big one, big front page thing, and I got fired, basically. But I'd gotten all the, all my, all the incredible documents out of my office, which was probably the most important office in the world for education change, international system of education, because U.S. is an important country, and I was in the Office of Educational Research and Improvement. I was a senior policy advisor. Not that I really merited that, that job, but we were supposed to be getting rid of the Department of Education. Reagan had promised that. And so they just put anybody into any slot. It didn't make any difference because we were meant to be getting rid of it. So I was lucky enough to be plopped into that slot, which meant that I was sitting in an office uh, immersed in all the old research, all the old grants and contracts, all the new ones, all the what contracts? Grants oh, and grants. contracts going all over the world, not just to U.S. universities and laboratories and centers, all over the world, to change education from academics to total brainwashing and the Soviet polytech system, school to work, Cuban system, German system where the children have absolutely no choice in their future occupation. They start training them, you know, in third, fourth grade for what they're going to be. The, the agreement is made between industry and government. That's the Soviet system if people don't know it. Uh, of course, they don't have uh, free enterprise industry, but they have industry. And that's part of the Soviet plan, plan right, the platform. And the same thing here now with, with partnerships between uh, business and the schools putting in this, this terrible system, this, this totally controlled system where uh, you have it's quotas, you know, this many doctors, this many lawyers, this is determined by the government and industry and the universities. Uh, how many ballet dancers? People understand that because that was the Soviet Union, uh, etc. So it's a planned economy, and uh, they do not educate. This is a direct quote from Professor Boyce, Eugene Boyce, University of Georgia, they do not educate for jobs that do not exist. He wrote a very interesting book on that, and he was not a conservative, but he was talking about the Soviet system. Same thing here. They're not going to educate your child in Bath, Maine, to be whatever she may want to be. Maybe she's going to want to be a landscape artist. huh? Uh, if there isn't an opening, or a lot of people out there who need that, She's no, she won't get an education here. She'll have to move elsewhere. Okay. So anyway, uh, that my office was it was devastating. The values, attitudes, values, and beliefs program, the change, the change programs for to destroy values that I found for elementary school throughout the country. One one was in Michigan, Lansing, Michigan, where they pre and post tested little kids. Before the program, pre-test to see where the values were, put them through the program, ask them all about mom and dad, what goes on at home, uh, what's this, what's that, all to do with their behavior and attitudes. And after the, after the program's finished, post-test to see if it worked. That is going on day in and day out in the American public school system. And when parents and whoever hear about test scores, assessment, etc., 
don't think that's traditional academics. It isn't. The mandated federal test, which came out of my office as well, the National Assessment for Education Progress, is 60% politically correct. So when you hear that your children in your state haven't done well on it, maybe you should say, I'd like to see the test. Rather than just assuming that anything coming out of the United States Department of Education is anything other than plain evil. It's a Marxist factory. And I know that's true, and I know someone who was heading up an NIE, who didn't last too long, he's a great educator, NIE. who said that. National Institute of Education, it used to be called. Mm -hmm. And the director of it, he got fired uh, under Ronald Reagan. Uh, he was the former head of the Cathedral School for Girls in Washington. No, no lightweight educator, a very fine educator, not a political guy. Hmm? He was a political appointee, but I'm, what I'm saying, he was not a rabid conservative or a rabid liberal. He was just a good educator who had that job. And he got fired because he wanted to get rid of his own office. And he knew as well as I did, I think he was the one who referred to it being a Marxist factory. So it's just as well for people to know that. Now, Ronald Reagan, uh, he could have gotten rid of the department. And if he didn't get rid of the department, if he couldn't have gotten that through Congress, he could have gotten rid of the office of... Uh, that I was in, the National Institute of Education, because that director recommended himself that his own office be abolished. That was the office that had to go. That was the office that dealt with testing, teacher training, program development, all these rotten programs out of the National Diffusion Network. Uh, if that office had gone, we would have really been in pretty good shape to get rid of the rest of it. So you'll, you'll find the conservatives all defending Reagan on that. Oh, well, it wasn't his fault. You really think it was his fault? Uh, you know, it's probably his fault. I, if I ever again hear about any government uh, cabinet secretary or, or uh, director of an office like the National Institute of Education or, or out of the White House saying, uh, being, being excused by the public as, oh, well, uh, you know, it's not his fault. It's not Bush's fault. It's Karl Rove. Or it's uh, someone else. Or, you know, he doesn't know what's going on. Look! Okay, if you don't know what's going on, you shouldn't be in the White House. He knows what's... He's not particularly bright, George Bush, but he's doing an awfully good job for those who want to take us down. You can't say that he isn't doing a wonderful job because Iraq was never meant to work the way we were told. They have to destroy the Middle East first in order to restructure it as a region. Okay, you asked about regions? All right, let's go back to regions. It's easier to deal with regions than it is with countries. And I think it was Lenin who said, we, the communists, will set up regions around the world. You, you implement socialism in about eight or ten regions. You get it, okay? The European Union is a very good example. That is a region. That is the region, that is the prototype for all the other regions around the world. The one they're setting up in Africa, Middle East, Bush, Vincenti Fox, Martin, Canada, here. Got about ten regions being set up, okay? Gorbachev sometimes really is useful. He said in London three or four years ago, he said, and think of this in terms of the United States region with Mexico and Canada too. Hmm? He said the European Union is the new European Soviet. Now, if that doesn't send chills up your spine for the old Europe, nothing will. But, if you don't care about Europe, what do you think Gorbachev would say about what George Bush is putting in here? Wouldn't he say that the merger of Mexico, the United States, and Canada is what? I'm going to ask the audience. Not the new European Soviet, but the new what? 
American Soviet. Oh, and then American example. What's wrong with that? Well, I say is, you know, then you, that's the education system, see? You, you, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. But it's not too late. You have been deliberately dumbed down. You ask me what's wrong with that. You better go find out what's wrong with any form of government that has an ism on the end of it. Fascism, communism, whatever. Nazism. Nazism. Uh, the United States, we are a Republican form of government, representative form of government, we're not a democracy. Thank God we're not a democracy. I mean, the, the communist countries call themselves democracies, do you understand me? Huh? They do. Uh, democracies where, you know, it's um, majority rules. We don't have that form of government, thank heavens. We don't. So, uh, what's going in right now could never have been put in had it not been for a diabolical plan, I call it the five-pronged fork. So I keep adding prongs to it, but let's go through this because you can understand. I came up with this because I do a lot of radio work, and I was getting really tired of beating up on the audience all the time. I just felt that I was always saying, come on, folks, get with it. What's wrong with you? How come you haven't seen these things? Why have you not done something about it? And then I realized that it was a stroke of good, good from the good Lord, probably, helping me out. All Americans who are alive right now and those who've died, you know, recently, they have been victimized. We have been subjected to a, at least a hundred year plan. And it, it was, it was a very simple plan. And it, I think it has five, five, five uh, prongs. It's a, I call it a five prong fork. Let's go through it. Gradualism. Everybody knows about the frog in the cold water. Okay, we were talking about Whitney and the rest of them back in 1880, making their plans to control both parties and how this would work out. And the Carnegie Corporation was the one who was given the job to destroy American academic education. I've got all the documents on that. And all these things that have happened, Ronald Reagan signing the agreement with Gorbachev to merge the two education systems. Uh, you know, there's so much in, say, since 1880 to 1980 and to now. Hmm? But they start out and they do everything slowly. And the frog, you know, is boiled slowly. The water, you heat the water up. And now here we are in year 2006 and it's bubbling. And the frog is really good. I think. Just about, you know, he's, he's got to be pretty fried. So it's gradual. You don't want, you don't see what's going on. It's generation to generation. How many generations there? Almost four. So each generation is being dumbed down. Because that's the plan. You do it through the schools. Carnegie Corporation said in 1934, I have an original document from them, we will use the schools to change America from a free individualistic economy to a socialist planned economy in the new order. That's a direct quote. Since then, Carnegie has been following, you know, you have to almost give it credit. You know, it's very easy to follow that tax exempt foundation. Right straight through, they, they control the testing. They signed the agreements with the Soviet Academy of Science. Same time Reagan signed the, uh, the agreement with Gorbachev to merge the two systems. Uh, Carnegie was deeply into the restructuring of American education, using David Hornbeck to go down, first of all, to Kentucky. And uh, that was for a school to work, totally. I mean, Hornbeck, who was involved right from the beginning, putting in the school to work agenda which I was you know it's like Cuba you know the quota system for jobs and all working with the government government industry uh, he said in a book Human Capital of that uh, with Lester Solomon he wrote that book he said the corporations don't want well educated people well educated people give us too much trouble they quit their jobs and all so don't forget that next time you hear that the corporations are upset about no basic skills and all that's not true they want people, cookie cutter, button pushing people, period. That's it. And so, anyway, we'll go back to the, the frog, okay? Gradualism. And morality, too. It just keep, we keep falling off the cliff more and more and more with the values clarification, but we're getting to that. The next thing, what's called the dialectic? The next thing. 
the dialectic is you have uh, the thesis and the antithesis and the synthesis in the middle. The thesis is it's wrong to steal. The antithesis is okay. Okay, you keep talking about it. have all these meetings in our communities. You know, oh, get the community involved. We're all going to discuss this stuff together. And you end up, you know, well, let's say it's wrong to steal drugs for your sick mother. It's wrong. No, after all the discussion, you come to the middle. It's okay sometimes. Because she's sick. She's going to die. So you can steal when she's going to die. Huh? Okay, so you move, you keep moving closer and closer, you finally fall right off the cliff, you have no morals left at all. And this could apply to homosexuality or, or murder or anything. I mean, look, if you, if you have a father that you don't like, who's been beating you up ever since you were two years old or, or, or other things, whatever, uh, you know, really, I'm sure that you really think it's okay to kill him. You can justify that in your mind. And that is what has happened to all of the sick character education, values education programs in this country which try to, to uh, base their curriculum uh, on, on uh, character education. With, uh, to base it on a system that uh, has no relationship whatsoever to Christianity. Right? You can't do it. It doesn't work. And we have all these children, these sad kids running around in trouble. Even if they're not in trouble, look at their faces. They're tragic. They can't read. They can't write. They can't talk. They can't smile. So we've done that. Okay. So then you, that's the dialectic. I hope people understand what the dialectic really is. Uh, one example of it, uh, this, this probably is the best because it's funny. Uh, when I came back to the United States, well, no, after I got married, after we had two children, and I was doing the laundry for my husband one day, he was white shirts, I put a red sweater in with his white shirts by mistake. This is what you talk about. You, you decide what you want, how are you going to get it? You create the problem, and then you give the people the solution you want. Okay? And they do it every day, the change agents. How are they going to get uh, education moved from the local level to the state level? Create the problem. Old people scream because the taxes are so high. Then they come in and say, oh, well, you know, we'll move education funding for the local and the state level. That's what they wanted all along. Everybody says, fine. But anyway, to make you understand, so I, I do that. My husband says, okay, you're never going to do laundry again, not for me. Now, say I didn't want to do laundry. In the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's the way I ended up never having to do laundry again for any of the men in my family. Because the boys knew what I'd done. Mm -hmm. And so, Mom, don't worry about it. We'll do our own laundry. So, you figure out what it is. You, I didn't want... I, I, I never had that plan in my mind, but I've always remembered that because it worked. Mm -hmm. And had I not wanted to do laundry ever again, that would have been... The perfect plan. Put a red sweater in with a man's white shirts. All the shirts are pink. They get upset and they say, you don't have to laundry anymore. So that is also the dialectic. Okay. Then you have semantic deception. You must, everybody must know it. Semantic means fake, false, lying, etc. So they use words that mean one thing to the parents like basic skills, and they think reading, writing, arithmetic, basic skills. No. Basic skills do not mean that anymore. Basic skills are anything's okay, right? Uh, the U.S. Constitution is outmoded. Uh, we have to go along with the rest of the world. We all have to get along. We have to give up the, the Constitution. That's, that's a basic skill. Global education would be involved in basic skills. So people, that's semantic deception. Uh, decision making, that's a really good one. Because I remember when I got rid of the values clarification as a school board member that night when I got the, even the liberals to go with me, the superintendent called me the next day and he said, Charlotte, this is the change agent superintendent out of Harvard, uh, would you mind if we um, put in a program in decision making? And I said, oh, I wish I could look in your beautiful blue eyes because you know that's exactly the same thing. 
And that was the last I heard of that. So if your superintendent tells the board, you're on a board, and he comes and he says, we really ought to help the kids in making decisions. Doesn't that sound innocent? And, every, and if you take a stand against it, everybody in the community is going to say, what's wrong with Charlotte Iserby? She doesn't want kids to be able to make decisions. Well, decision-making is values clarification. And values clarification is values destruction. Okay, that semantic deception, you can apply it to all sorts of words. George Orwell knew very well what it was. George Bush really knows. You know, so he gives us a, an act after 9-11, which takes away all of our freedoms under the Bill of Rights. And what's he call it? The Patriot, the Patriot Act. He puts in an initiative now to screen all children for mental problems. And he calls it, in the schools, the Freedom Initiative. Well, I mean, really, it is hard to believe that uh, this is going on and people are not questioning this. I mean, the use of words, I mean, it, every, it just goes on and on and on. And Patriot, I mean, we are no longer, you are not, you're not a Patriot, I'm not a Patriot. Anybody who opposes this, government, this administration's agenda is being carefully monitored and watched. I mean, Patrick Henry would have been a perfect candidate for Guantanamo. Really. It's sad. And then the American people are just letting, letting this go by. So anyway, so we've gone through, we went through the frog, the uh, gradualism, we've been through the dialectic, we've been through semantic deception. Uh, of course, you have big bucks. And, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve, endless amounts of money. Uh, printed out of nothing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Printed out of absolutely nothing. And uh, I'm trying to think of what the other one was. I can't think of it right at the moment. But uh, it's been a plan. You've been victimized. And uh, there's no, it's no wonder that the American people have sort of gone down as far as having any desire to understand what's going on. They've been conditioned. The media, of course, is one of the prongs of the fork, too. By the media, they've been conditioned to believe anything they hear on the nightly news. And even though they may say, oh, well, you know, I, I don't think I agree with that. But you have to remember that when something is uh, every night beamed into the house of the same message even though you may say you know you sort of don't agree with it it's in there it's in your head you've been conditioned uh, so the next time the subject comes up if someone in the room uh, disagrees with it you're probably not going to take a stand against it because you've been pretty conditioned to accept it I mean we look at us 4th of July magnificent Independence Day from the British uh Look at the people out on the street. What, what are they marching around for with American flags? I mean, this is, this is so sad because we're not independent from anybody anymore. We're in a one-world government. China controls us. I mean, if China pulled the plug, what would we do? I mean, look, look at the, the deficit, trade deficit. China controls us. We're, we're controlled all over the world. The, the Middle East, they, oil. Look, look, I mean, it's, if people don't see this, the cost of oil right now. George Bush told us four years ago, you know, oil is going to flow, everything's going to be... No, we have no independence whatsoever. And we're not meant to, because my book will tell you all about that. All, all the chapters, the entries in there, are quotes going back a hundred years that we've got to get rid of independence. We've got, we, we shouldn't have sovereignty any longer. We have to become part of this collectivist world government. That's the plan. So what are we doing running around celebrating Independence Day? Independence from Great Britain. I wish we were independent from Great Britain. Personally, we're not. We may have fought a war to be independent from them, but look at us in the Gulf. Who's our big ally there? Who are we doing it for? Who do we do Kuwait for? Great Britain. 
British Petroleum. What interest did we have out there to move it to Kuwait? I mean, I, I thought that George Washington said to beware of foreign entanglements. What are we doing? And we're, and we're marching around with little American flags and, and they've got all the uh, fairs going on downtown with all the amusements for the children and barbecues and singing the Star Spangled Banner. And yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I love America and, and uh, I, I give my life for my country. And, and you probably had relatives who have and I've had relatives who have. My son was in the first Gulf War. And I, I tell you, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely outrageous that all the servicemen who have died for uh, their belief in our Constitution and the Bill of Rights They've died for this. And we don't seem to care. We've got a bunch of traitors in Washington who sit there voting down the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, every day. And, and then we've got generations to come of innocent children who are going to live in this totalitarian system. They're going to live under this and they're going to be happy. I mean, it, it, it couldn't have gotten worse. I mean, I thought things were bad 10 years ago. They are so bad now, and people are going to say, I wish that woman would just shut up and tell us what we can do, you know. But I've been trying to tell people what to do for 30 years. And right now, I think there are things that could be done, but to get the American people on board is not going to be that easy. Uh, there are many things. I mean, you, we could all stop paying our taxes. Uh, we could all keep our children out of school. There are many, many ways to, to uh, object, but with the walls going up, the borders becoming so porous, and this country becoming so multinational, it's not, I don't have anything against foreigners, I never have. In fact, I think the, the majority, you know, if only American people understood that uh, I'm not alone when I talk like this. I mean, I, I know many foreigners in the Far East and Africa and who are all equally upset about every single thing that I have talked about today because this is an international system that's being imposed. It's not just on us. I mean, all it, inhabitants of this planet are going to be affected by the same exact system that's being put in everywhere, region by region. After all, the regions are formed, then, as Lenin said, they all join together. The regions are all joined together and they go under international socialism, which is communism. And I believe the state, the federal government, basically will wither away. Interestingly enough, it's being, you can see it happening right now. Uh, we have all these exchanges with, with the former Soviet Union and other countries where uh, our police are being trained with their police and uh, all sorts of exchanges going on. Not with a federal level. It's with a local level, if you notice. Everything is going to be local. And they're going to bypass our elected constitutional form of government in Washington and at the state level. It's going to be brought, everything brought down to the local level. That's why you have the sustainable development stuff and all going on. And the local level is going to be hooked in to the UN. And that will be through organizations like the International Union of Local Authorities. That's a good one to go to on the website. And you'll see that our local authorities who've been doing these exchanges with foreign countries and all, uh, they are going to be the ones in charge. And there will be no representation for us at our state level any longer or federal level. Everything will, all the instructions are going to be coming out of the UN to the local level. Now that's just Charlotte talking, but I'm pretty sure I've been watching this for a long time because I remember Lenin saying this, the the state would wither away. And uh, the local level, that's why they've got community-oriented policing. Uh, they're putting all the police on the streets. You can see the, the military and the, the uh, state police are 
are emerging. This is to control us. Much easier to control us right here in our own communities than from Washington. Huh? Mm-hmm. It's getting closer and closer. It's very scary. And there are lots of plans in the making to really do away with elected officials, setting up the little, uh, you could almost call, you know, it's little community councils with appointed people who are going to make sure that people like myself have very little say and who knows, maybe the electricity might even not even work in my house. You know, there'll be all sorts of, because if you don't have elected officials, you have no representation, there is no accountability whatsoever from those people because they don't have to run for office. You can't get rid of them. This most serious thing that happened in this country, I think, in the past 30 years, was what you'd call site-based management. And it started, interesting enough, with the schools because everything eventually will come under the, the umbrella of the school district, lifelong. These huge Taj Mahal's that are being built all over the country, you know, as schools, they're going to be, for the, all the community services, will be underneath that umbrella. Well, by the way, we've got about 30 seconds or so. Okay. So, uh... Yeah, it's gone so fast because it's so interesting, but do you have any last pearl of wisdom? Well, the most important thing for people to watch out for is having, having them take their elected officials away from them in the, at the local level. Do not let it happen. Also, do not fall for school choice in any form whatsoever except the old one where you pay to go to private school or homeschooling where you do it on your own. Do not have anything whatsoever to do with the federal, state, or local tax, tax money. If you do, you're going to have to, your children will have to take the federal test, which is, as I said, 60% politically correct. So as far as education is concerned, be up in arms against charter schools, which are also our public schools. They're, they're the basic thing for a school to work, charter schools. A lot of people think that they're private schools. They're not. They're federally funded. Uh, computer instruction, very dangerous. Watch it, no matter where it's coming from, uh, because that's the method, the Skinner method, dog training method on the computer. Skinner said, I, uh, the computer is my box. Don't forget that when you train your children that way. So anyway, that's all I can say. And, and become educated. Go to my two websites.